uh, senior class of the Corps of Cadets since this is their big theme this year. We also have uh, their dates, uh, various representatives from other military schools. I mean, everyone pretty much except the Coast Guard Academy. Uh, we're looking at other guests such as uh, university <laughs> officials, community leaders, uh, Admiral Moore and flag officers, and the group. How many schools are represented? Estimate would be about nine or ten. Yeah, we're, we're going to be. Everyone, please remain standing for the presentation of the colors. I O Arch. Major General Taylor, Mrs. Taylor, Major General Allen, Mrs. Allen, Deputy Commandants and ROTC Professors, Representatives from the various military academies and colleges, Distinguished Community and University Leaders, and the Class of 2000. My name is Cadet Wayne Nemo, and I'm honored to bring tonight's guest to you, Admiral Thomas H. Moore. Admiral Moore, considered by many to be the greatest living Admiral today, began his naval career by graduating in 1933 at the head of his class at the Naval Academy. As a naval aviator, Admiral Moore's illustrious career began by flying PBYs during World War II. Admiral Moore played a key role at the Battle of Midway as being one of the first Americans to spot the approaching Japanese strike force during a reconnaissance patrol. Admiral Moore is also one of the very few who could say that he was shot down from his aircraft and sunk on a, same, on a ship in the same day. In 1958, Admiral Moore achieved the rank of Rear Admiral and continued on to 1964 where he was promoted to Admiral. In 1965, Admiral Moore became the only Admiral to command both the Pacific and the Atlantic fleets. 
After advancing to the position as head of NATO, the Admiral was offered the position of the Chief of Naval Operations by President Johnson in 1967. Under President Nixon, he was appointed to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff for two terms, from 1970 to 1974. Following this appointment, the Admiral retired from the Navy in 1974. Admiral Moore has been honored for his accomplishments by having the Navy's Supreme Strike Fighter, the Tomcat, named after him, and also receiving the first annual Naval Academy Alumni Association Special Award and the first annual Liberty Veterans Award. Admiral Moore continues to support, advise, and defend many organizations and, pro and projects promoting America's national security, moral strength, and national values including the National Security Council, the Liberty Veterans Association, and a special project with former Admiral Thomas Hayward to move the USS Missouri right next to the USS Arizona to serve as a memorial at Pearl Harbor. Admiral Morrow's long, li long life service and commitment to his country serves as an excellent example for those who have served with him, who serve today, and will continue to serve in the future. And on a side note, Admiral Moore has a special attachment to Virginia Tech. For last year, his grandson, Richard Moore, graduated from Tech. Everyone, please extend a warm welcome to our guest of honor, Admiral Thomas Moore. you, I want to express my appreciation for your help in uh, bringing the representatives of the uh, Liberty uh, down here to uh, talk to uh, uh, members of the court. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, I find it a particular pleasure to uh, come down here. I think that uh, this is a special organization, and I think that uh, one can look around at these uh, young cadets and uh, see what uh, great value they are to the uh, United States in terms of uh, not only security but also uh, uh, prosperity of our country as we move into uh, this uh, new age of, of period. I think that it's clear to me that the uh, faculty here uh, quite properly uh, spills this spends uh, quite a bit of time on character. And to me, character is a key uh, human element. And if, if you thumb through Mr. Webster's dictionary, you will see uh, words like uh, uh, ethnicity, and honesty, and veracity, and you can go all down the list. And when you uh, put all those words together, and the one word, it comes out character. That's what we're talking about. One cannot lead without character. And uh, uh, anyone who attempts to lead by making rules that he refuses to satisfy himself is uh, not going to stand up very long as an effective uh, leader. Now, what I want to talk about, uh, I've uh, made uh, many uh, talks to uh, midshipmen and cadets, and uh, uh, most of the time I tell them I know exactly what they're thinking. They, what they are thinking, they're asking themselves a question. Uh, why don't that old saltwater animal sit down so we can get on with the program? <laughs> and so with that in mind, I thought I would uh, uh, cut my word short because this is a uh, special uh, time for me because it was uh, exactly uh, about uh, in 1942 when uh, as uh, Cadet Nemo Mason I was uh, shot down and uh, if anything uh, will make you a Christian and when that happens uh, that's that. Uh, uh, let me go back a bit. I was at Pearl Harbor when the Japanese attacked, and uh, 
my plan uh, was find a, a big uh, float plane with a crew of eight, and uh, they were all destroyed by strafing, and we uh, immediately received uh, 12 new planes from the States and was ordered to the Philippines. We never got to the Philippines because the Japanese captured before we got there, and we wound up in uh, Australia and operated all the way from Singapore to uh, Darwin, Australia. And uh, in the meantime, the Japanese, when they departed from Pearl Harbor, uh, had six aircraft carriers. They sent two to uh, capture Wake Island, which uh, was on the uh, uh, airline to the Orient from uh, Hawaii. And the other four uh, went south to attack uh, Hawaii, I mean attack uh, Australia. And uh, one day I was on a patrol uh, looking for these aircraft carriers, and I found them. And uh, they were a large number of planes on the way to attack Darwin, and these fighters peeled off and uh, attacked me, and I promptly uh, uh, set my uh, plane afire. And we didn't have leak-proof gas tanks in, although they existed, and we'd given all that we manufactured to the British. And that kind of burnt me up when I watched my plane <laughs> run up. Along with the plane. But anyway, I hit the water, and we managed to, uh, all of us were wounded, but fortunately not fatally, and uh, we managed to get into a love, uh, rubber boat. We had uh, uh, two rubber boats, one of them was full of holes. I could <laughs> see the uh, uh, bullets, the Japanese were firing these 30 millimeter uh, incendiary bullets. The one came right over my shoulder into the instrument panel, and fortunately, uh, I wasn't using the instrument panel anyway. <laughs> uh, I got the airplane down on the water, which we did. We get in the uh, life raft, and uh, very shortly, I see this uh, uh, ship coming over and picked us up. When I got aboard, I find out that it was a Philippine ship that was on its way to Corregidor to carry ammunition, uh, which uh, was needed by General MacArthur at that time in his air, air defense effort, and that the ship was loaded from stem to stern with uh, ammunition. So I told my crew that I was confident we were going to get attacked again, and they were all to get back on the stern and wait for my orders. We, sure enough, we went back on the stern, and I sat there till about 2 o'clock, it was hot as hell, it was right on the equator, but nevertheless, uh, we uh, sat there, and I looked up there all of a sudden, and I saw uh, nine dive bombers coming straight down at the ship, so I made every one of them jump in the ocean, <laughs> <laughs> except one who uh, was up uh, to see the captain or something. I don't know why he didn't obey my orders, but anyway, he left the group, and we never did see him again. But uh, we jumped in the water, and uh, the ship went down at an angle, leaving the stern uh, above water and with the two lifeboats there. I climbed back on the uh, ship, the, the, uh, well, just a small part of it now is above water, cut the lifeboats loose and uh, picked up all the Filipinos that survived, picked up my crew except the one man we lost, and they had no, no compass and no water and no food and, but they did have sail, and I knew how to sail, so I put my co-pilot in one, and I got in the other, and we set sail for Australia. But the third night I heard the, the surf, and uh, it was an uninhabited island north of Darwin, and we beached. It was the most beautiful white sand you ever saw, it, just like sugar. And uh, uh, Fortunately, there were no cigarette butts, no Coca-Cola bottles, no sandwiches, and no pieces of paper because no one had ever been there. It was an uninhabited island called Bathurst Island. So we wrote in uh, letters about the size of this table piece here, water and medicine. And an uh, 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 Australian reconnaissance plane came over. Uh, he saw that and he dropped a note and said, I'll be back. He came back later, and he dropped water and medicine. He dropped another note and said, uh, uh, we're going to pick you up at daylight. At daylight, they came over and picked us up and headed for Darwin. 
we just about got underway when along comes a, uh, a Japanese uh, uh, flying boat and starts bombing us one bomb at a time. Uh, and uh, the captain had just come from Crete and the Mediterranean, which was the first place where, the, where land was captured by paratroopers. And he had been fighting the Germans. You know, that's where Mount Batten's destroyer was sunk and so on. So he was always comparing the Japanese and the Germans. And he thought the Japanese were punks. And he, <laughs> he had a uh, tar barrel on the stern of the ship. And every time this uh, uh, Japanese plane would start a horizontal bombing run, he would light off this uh, uh, tar barrel and back down in the smoke and they never, they never touched us. When we uh, had uh, finished uh, the, uh, uh, using up all the ammunition, of course they left, and we entered Darwin. When we arrived at Darwin, the captain said, uh, uh, I'm sorry, but said, I got another mission, I got to put you off. He put us off at Darwin. I had been there once before, went to the hotel, looked around town, wasn't a man, woman, and child in the town. Every one of them was so sure they're gonna get invaded that they'd put to the brush. So we moved in the hotel. They had nice whiskey in the bar, <laughs> steaks in the ice box. So we set up shop. And finally, uh, um, I, I got in with my squadron, and they came uh, up and picked me up. And so that was uh, uh, one episode. Uh, a little later. I found out that the captain of the Philippine ship had uh, had a contract with the army to uh, take this ammunition to Corregidor, and uh, he was having a little trouble uh, getting the army to read his contract, I think. But anyway, uh, I managed to get him in a hospital, and subsequent to that time, uh, his daughter has uh, sent me a Christmas present every Christmas since, which is many, many years which I thought it was a, a very uh, a nice uh, touch on her part. So that was so much for that uh, operation. I uh, just uh, one more uh, sea story it had to do with the Battle of Midway, where the Japanese were trying to capture the island of Midway in order to uh, have a, uh, a block of any shipping coming from the United States across the Pacific, and uh, they uh, put together all their forces and uh, came out. We did the same thing with our Army, uh, Navy, and Air Force. And uh, there was a big battle that took place in the Battle of Midway. And uh, when the smoke cleared and the fire cleared and everything was over, four of the Japanese aircraft carriers were sitting on the bottom of the ocean, belly up, and they still there, so far as I know. Uh, but in any event, that was the end of the Japanese. They never uh, uh, once had uh, entered up forward with another offensive uh, operation in the Pacific. And it was, in effect, uh, the turning point of the war, I think. And so uh, uh, that's why I keep talking about character, because all of the people that participated in that battle uh, the young men uh, were uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, had character because the odds were heavy. And uh, incidentally, these four carriers that were on the bottom had been at Pearl Harbor just six months before. And that was the end of the Japanese. So uh, I formed an uh, uh, organization called the Battle of Midway Foundation. And we uh, have established a monument now on that little speck of sand. And I have been out there twice, once last year, and again uh, this year. And uh, uh, just to uh, keep the uh, uh, idea alive that what happened there was uh, an example of joint operations, uh, which uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, took care of the Japanese once for all. So those are the two combat operations that I remember the most. Uh, although I was at Pearl Harbor and went through all that. And uh, subsequent to that time, I uh, have uh, uh, gone back and forth, met many of these uh, gentlemen here that uh, also had the same kinds of experience. 
But uh, I just want to say once again uh, how encouraged I am to see uh, what this uh, great institution does. And I'm not sure we're not going to meet, meet them again. And when that happens, I'm confident that the graduates of the, uh, this uh, fine institution will be right there defending uh, the United States of America against all enemies, both foreign and domestic. And don't kid yourself, we got foreign ones too. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh. <laughs>